And for years, critics have condemned a long-lasting U.S.-led war in Afghanistan. Now, as the U.S. completes its troop withdrawal, the Biden administration is taking much of the blame for a miscalculated and catastrophic end to this war. Our next report examines what role each of the four presidents have played in the past 20 years and what their share of the legacy may be. Twenty years after the United States toppled the Taliban, the world watched as the group reclaimed Afghanistan without much opposition in a matter of days. The withdrawal of American forces and their allies has fallen on the shoulders of every U.S. president after George W. Bush. This year, the pullout was completed under Joe Biden, exposing what critics have called a can of worms. The conflict has cost trillions of dollars, funds meant for the upkeep of U.S. troops and Afghanistan's economic development. Some 200,000 people have died, a third of them were civilians, and millions have been displaced. Now, Many are asking, what was America's longest war for? Shortly after one of the deadliest days in U.S. history, President George W. Bush declared a global war on terror. America's main target was the Islamist militant group Al-Qaeda and its leader, Osama bin Laden, identified as the mastermind behind 9-11. The military campaign centered on Taliban-ruled Afghanistan, which Washington has accused of protecting terrorists. The United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations. But some analysts have said that there was more to the U.S. invasion than meets the eye. His first objective, again, was to, was to try to leverage 9-11 into an attack on Iraq. Um, but in terms of the broader geostrategic objectives, one was to uh, uh, put this massive U.S. military footprint in Central Asia because there were broader strategic interests at stake uh, related to containing Russia and China. U.S. firepower routed the Taliban government within a span of two months. A week after the war began, the group said it might hand over bin Laden for trial in a third country if the U.S. would stop bombing and present evidence that he was connected to 9-11. There's no need to discuss innocence or guilt. We know he's guilty. Turn him over. If they want us to stop our military operations, they just got to meet my conditions. And when I said no negotiations, I meant no negotiations. Bombing continued as bin Laden escaped to Pakistan. A year later, President Bush announced a reconstruction plan for the battle-torn country, redirecting military support to the war in Iraq. Press coverage of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan portrayed the conflict as difficult but necessary. If we're looking at it in, in sort of cold, hard, real politics, um, the U.S. was following in its, its interest here, but it should have been clear from the start that this was never really about liberating Afghanistan, never really about liberating Afghan women, uh, never really about establishing a new state or, or democracy, but rather fulfilling uh, the, the strategic objectives of uh, American uh, superpower unilateralism. But the violence did not stop as the Taliban and other groups maintained pockets of resistance across the country. Under President Barack Obama, the U.S. ramped up troops to help fight off insurgency. In 2011, there were more than 100,000 American soldiers in Afghanistan. The goal appeared simple but ambitious. 
The U.S. would help train Afghan forces, stabilize the government and leave by the end of the year. Early into the conflict in, in, in Vietnam, that, that the U.S. position was unwinnable. And uh, I think we have that same sort of uh, uh, realization that's taking place during the Obama administration. So I think what we see over time is the Obama administration slowly drawing down uh, forces so they can't be blamed historically, but uh, also avoiding taking responsibility uh, for uh, uh, the real problem uh, at hand. On May 2nd, 2011, nearly a decade after the 9-11 attacks, President Obama announced what would be perceived as a foreign policy victory. That the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. After nearly 10 years of service, struggle, and sacrifice, we know well the costs of war. But continued threats of insecurity kept the U.S. in Afghanistan. Troops were significantly scaled down by 2014, but they did not leave entirely. We have to recognize Afghanistan will not be a perfect place. And it is not America's responsibility to make it one. The future of Afghanistan must be decided by Afghans. But what the United States can do, what we will do, is secure our interests and help give the Afghans a chance, an opportunity to seek a long overdue and hard-earned peace. America's military involvement in the Afghan conflict can be traced as far back as the 1970s way before its own war. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. The Soviets left Afghanistan and then we said, great, goodbye, leaving these trained people who were fanatical in Afghanistan and Pakistan, leaving them well armed, creating a mess, frankly, that uh, at the time we didn't really recognize. We were just so happy to see the Soviet Union fall. Now you look back, the people we're fighting today, we were supporting in the fight against the Soviet. Uh, Donald John Trump, when Donald Square. Trump took office in 2017, the Afghan war had grown largely unpopular among Americans. Trump was critical of previous administrations. When I became president, I was given a bad and very complex hand. But I fully knew what I was getting into. We must address the reality of the world as it exists right now, the threats we face, and the confronting of all of the problems of today, and extremely predictable consequences of a hasty withdrawal. For years, peace talks stalled amid infighting among Afghan factions. But in February 2019, the U.S. announced the result of its own negotiations with the Taliban. The deal? All U.S. troops and their allies out of Afghanistan, with the guarantee that the Taliban would keep terrorist groups out as well. As we speak, the United States is also working to end the war in Afghanistan, and we are bringing our troops home. America is fulfilling our destiny as peacemaker, but it is peace through strength. Some accused Trump of seeking a distraction from his government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Trump had really, uh, from the beginning, sold his, his uh, political brand as repudiating the old Republicans. He really targeted uh, Bush. Uh, for lying about uh, the, the war on terror, for, for uh, having this misguided strategy into Afghanistan and Iraq. And clearly, you know, by Trump's time in power, this was no longer uh, really delivering strategic benefits, but just massive costs. As a result, uh, he wants to uh, advance this goal because it's become part of his, his uh, uh, talking points for re-election. 
When Joe Biden became president, however, he followed through on Trump's policy and in April announced a complete end to the Afghan military operation by September 11th exactly 20 years after the 9-11 attacks. But what the Biden administration did not anticipate was the pace at which the Taliban regained control as the U.S. made their exit. The speed of the Taliban's advance has been very surprising. The fact that the Taliban are advancing is not surprising, and I attribute that to President Biden's decision. He, I think, delivered a crippling morale blow to the Afghan army and they no longer believed they had the resources they needed to win. Biden has defended his decision, saying nation building was not the United States purpose in Afghanistan, contradicting those in the Bush era who said they would rebuild the country. You have to be honest. Our mission in Afghanistan is taking many missteps, made many missteps over the past two decades. I'm now the fourth American president to preside over war in Afghanistan, two Democrats and two Republicans. I will not pass this responsibly on, responsibility on to a fifth president. The last couple days I've been struggling with the emotion of it. Just the, there, there's a mix of anger, a mix of depression, um, you know, about what's happening. The blame here isn't the, the, the fact that the catastrophe has occurred, because again, it might have, it might have happened regardless, rather that Biden has seemed uh, so indifferent to the consequences and did so little to try to prevent it. A former United Nations envoy has described the U.S. withdrawal as a colossal failure, but also suggests the blame cannot be pinned on a single administration, much less a single leader. Uh, I think the proper way to describe this uh, is that the Biden administration implemented the Trump Surrender Agreement uh, that was signed uh, uh, in 2020. And, you know, we can debate who's most culpable. I don't think that's a, a particularly productive thing. If we want to know where, where it went wrong, I would say maybe around the beginning of 2002. The blame game in Washington has already begun in earnest. And, uh, you know, those who support the president say it's Trump's fault. And those who support Trump say it's Biden's fault. And some people say, no, it's Ashraf Ghani's fault. And other people say, no, it's the intelligence community's fault. And they say it's George W. Bush's fault for, you know. And and uh, I think here, uh, failure is going to have a thousand fathers. Meanwhile, analysts say America's unilateral decisions on Afghanistan are raising concerns among its allies, from hasty peace talks under Trump to a hasty pullout under Biden. He was negotiating uh, unilaterally with the Taliban, uh, excluding American allies who had supported the U.S. in Afghanistan and even excluding the Afghan government, he really uh, shifted what was happening on the ground. Despite growing fatigue from the conflict, some Americans believe U.S. efforts were not in vain. In the 20 years that the United States and our partners have been in Afghanistan, a new generation of Afghan leaders has stepped forward to help chart a better future for the country. Their ranks include women's rights activists, independent journalists, anti-corruption crusaders, and democracy advocates. But Professor Mahoney says it's hard to put a positive spin on defeat. In time, uh, the disaster in Afghanistan will be remembered as an American failure, not simply attributable to one president. It will be remembered as the clearest example of imperial hubris, as squandering the peace dividend after the Cold War as the continuation of permanent war with the so-called war on terror, as the unjust deserts of a global superpower acting unilaterally without impunity. Within less than two weeks, the Taliban's advance unfolded like a takeover waiting to happen. Questions have been raised over how the group gained so much traction in the past two decades. The Taliban say they believe most Afghans never supported or grew frustrated by the U.S. in power. Occupation is occupation. It is lack of freedom. It is uh, that uh, many things are imposed on the people. You, you do not have independent economic policy. 
uh, uh, political policy uh, and uh, social policy, say so and so. So, but in the independence, you are the owner. You take up decision and uh, implement them. And uh, you take decision bearing in mind the interest of your country and of your people. Over the centuries, Afghanistan's location at crossroads of Asia has made it a battlefield for competing empires, from the Persians to the Mongols. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the British and the Soviets invaded and were forced to leave. Now it's the United States' turn, and many are asking if they should have descended on Afghanistan in the first place. What legacy will be left behind? Who should take responsibility for the war? And above all, will the U.S. continue or change its long-standing policy of military interventionism? <laughs>